Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Megan McCauley. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Membership at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. As always, I want to begin the event today by sharing my gratitude on behalf of everyone at the museums for your ongoing membership support. We are so touched by how many of you have supported us throughout the six month long closure. It really kept us going throughout the summer and it has made us so excited to welcome you back to the museums as we reopen. Thank you. So in case you don't have the news yet, the De Young Museum has officially reopened its doors. And if you haven't already visited or made a reservation, Please note the time tickets are required and I encourage you to reserve those tickets in advance on the website as they are booking up several days in advance. Now, throughout this year, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco have launched many new initiatives to support our local community. And perhaps most notable among these efforts is the De Young Open, the juried community art exhibition featuring submissions by artists who live in the nine Bay Area counties. Our jury reviewed more than 11,000 artworks submitted by more than 6,000 Bay Area artists and selected 880 works to be installed edge to edge in 19th century salon style in the De Young's Herbst Special Exhibition Galleries, our largest exhibition space. It's a phenomenal effort to review the works by so many talented Bay Area based artists and we're so excited to share them with you all. At this time, I'd like to thank all of our De Young Open supporters, including our donors, our members, all those who contributed to the recovery fund, and of course, to the thousands of artists who submitted their work for consideration. Now, today we're embarking upon an artist talk and conversation with artist and exhibition juror, Mildred Howard, and Claudia Schmuckley, curator in charge of contemporary art and programming. We'll begin the event today with a presentation by Mildred Howard that will be followed by a discussion between Mildred and Claudia. So allow me to introduce them both to you now. Bay Area-based artist, activist, and educator Mildred Howard has consistently engaged and served her community for more than 40 years as a professional artist. Howard has been the recipient of numerous awards, including a National Endowment for the Arts grant and sculpture, two Rockefeller Foundation Artist Fellowships, the Joan Mitchell Fellowship, and an Anonymous Was a Woman Award. Her work is included in major collections, such as the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, and she has been widely exhibited internationally at venues in Cairo, Berlin, Paris, London, Egypt, Ghana, and Morocco. In 2011, the city of Berkeley proclaimed March 29th Mildred Howard Day. In 2012, Howard was inducted into the Alameda County Hall of Fame and received San Francisco's prestigious Silver Spur Award. Claudia Schmuckley is the inaugural curator in charge of contemporary art and programming at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Since joining the museums in 2016, she has developed a dynamic and innovative program, including dialogical exhibitions and commissions. Most recently, she curated Specters of Disruption, an exhibition drawing from the museum's permanent collection, connecting the geological and colonial underpinnings of the De Young Museum to the current conditions in Northern California, and Uncanny Valley, Being Human in the Age of AI, the first major museum exhibition in the United States to reflect on the political and philosophical stakes of artificial intelligence from an artistic perspective. Previously, she was director and, cur and chief curator of the Blaffer Art Museum at the University of Houston, where she organized more than 30 exhibitions two incredibly talented individuals who will be in conversation with you today. And I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. Now I present Mildred Howard's presentation. Please enjoy. Thank you for inviting me to, to, to participate in this series along with my colleagues Enrique Chigoya and Hung Lu. Uh, in one respect, it seems strange to be talking about my work in these very difficult times. But then again, maybe it's the perfect time and hopefully only even if it's for a brief moment, I can take you on this journey of my thinking and practicing art. And I've, I've heard that, is this the new norm? Well, yes, it is the new norm, at least for now. 
the idea of public art as a separate discipline is a novel one to me. I've been creating work that involves and addresses the public both within and beyond the narrow definitions of the art world for as long as I've been making work. The work that you are viewing uh, is both work in progress and work that I'm, uh, I've completed. So what you're looking at now, three shades of blue, is I wanted to show this first because this one disturbs me the most. Uh, what was once I consider a jewel of the city has been vandalized and not maintained. Three Shades of Blue at Fillmore and Gary took many, many years to develop and over a year of meeting with com key uh, community members in Japantown. And the history of this area is both complex and rich. There, there are people, the Japanese community settled there after the 1906 earthquake. And then the migration of African-Americans that came during the, uh, the, the, what Isabel Wilkerson calls the, the warmth of other suns, the great migration. And the small, there was a small Jewish community in this Western edition. And so the Blue Bridge speaks to that community. And when I was approached by the, the former San Francisco Redevelopment Agency to do this piece, they specifically asked for glass. And I suppose that was based on my previous projects that I had done. So this, I had seen Quincy Troop on Bill Moyer, and I decided to contact him. He had just completed Miles Davis's autobiography. And I decided to contact him because I liked how he described music and how his words presented visual image, images to me in my mind. And so he came up with, he did 15 renditions of the poem before it was etched into this glass. And the poem speaks to this, as he states, this cultural jambalaya stew and talks about what brings this community together. And now when I go past it with bullet holes and scratches and someone has painted it a cerulean blue that does not go with the bridge. It's uh, deeply disturbing. So poetry for me captures the essence of my conceptual thinking. The poet uses words that I see in images, in images. It's like a natural um, marriage between the two. Richmond, like San Francisco is situated on the San Francisco Bay. The difference is that it is surrounded by oil refineries. At the time of doing this piece, Richmond had one of the highest illiteracy rates among adults in the country. So I decided to work with Project Read. And once again, I contacted Ishmael Reed to work with me and this group uh, from Project Read to talk about what is it, what do you like about Richmond? What keeps you here? So these, this piece, this is Corten Steel, about 18 by 40 feet, maybe a foot and a half from the building, um, is a result of that. And all the words are in the negative space. And as the time of day or the season changes, the shadow casts itself 
across the building. And you can see a little bit down in the lower uh, left-hand corner. And here you see it a little better. Richmond is interesting because African Americans and poor people from the South also might have migrated there, but you don't hear about those things. You don't hear about the Richmond Auditorium with James Brown, B.B. Uh, King, Sam Cooke, and, and West, Sweet West Oakland's um, Pete Escovito all perform there. But that's something you just don't hear about. You hear about the numerous mur uh, murders that are happening. So this, this pays tribute to that, to those people, the working, the pink and blue collars of that community. Uh, Marin County is one of the, I, one of the, I think it's the fifth richest uh, county in the United States, or it once was. But they have a huge, huge homeless population, similar to what's happening in other parts of the Bay Area, and in fact, the whole West Coast. Project uh, Homeward Bound, next key project, is a, pro a program that provides housing for families and individuals who were homeless, along with vocational training. And if one, when one is feeling despondent and a sense of not having hope, you're looking down. So a metaphor for that, for me, was to take the key and twist it and drop it with the top down. So this key is the entryway along a walkway, a, a probably 90 yards or more walkway. And they line this walkway going from bent to straight. What I like about this program is that when you leave, you have actual skills. Along with um, the vocational training, you also receive counseling. Uh, I work with, I was approached by uh, Evelyn Topper to do this project and a group of uh, concerned citizens of the area. And my idea for this counterface was to collect silver objects, the kind that we have stored away in our cabinets and maybe we pull it out for Thanksgiving special occasions and on Christmas and otherwise they're just left there. And then nowadays people are trying to sell off all of these kinds of objects. So I work with Dorothy Lenahan at um, Lenahan Architectural Glass. And for this, I wanted to place all these silver objects inside this mullion. And the mirror on the, on the back of this mullion and glass on the front. And that was the, what I decided to do was to have the objects also etched onto both surfaces, surfaces to give a little more depth. And what more, I can't think of a better place to have something like this than for people who are trying to change their lives and get a part of this so-called American dream. This was a fun project that I did for the Sacramento uh, Pocket Library. I took palindronic letters and etch them into dichroic glass. This, these panels are separated, separate the adult section from the children's section. And I imagine being a child who spent so much time in the library, trying to figure out how many words 
I can come up with these 11 letters. And as the day changes, the, the light changes in this glass. And this kind of using dichroic glass is a result of me working at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, which is a, mu a museum for art, science, and human perception. And until I started working there years ago, I never realized the relationship that artists and scientists have. They, they come up with a question, they pursue an idea, and the idea takes them on this journey and on this path. You can go one way and find out information or and you can go another and find out something entirely new. And that's one of the wonderful things about art. Uh, gentrification in this area has, and many parts of the United States have displaced so many black and brown people. And I think all of that has been magnified by the pandemic. And you see the inequities of this country. I don't know what it's gonna take to change. It may change for a minute and then go back to the way it was. I'm, I'm just not sure, but I do know that we as citizens need to vote. Glide. Uh, Glide, I think, is one of the great institutions we have in Northern California because they do not discriminate. All are welcome. Uh, DBG Ventures and Millennium Partners approached me to apply for a project with Glide. They were building a 14 story complex right on Mason Street in San Francisco. Many of you may have passed it. And at the time I was in, I was in a residency in Bellagio, Italy. And I had just read a poem by Langston Hughes. And, and the poem talked about the plight of African Americans. I, and so when I, I was interviewed while I was in Italy and found out that I received the project and I was like completely thrilled. What I did when I came back is I worked with Janice Miracatani, who was the poet laureate of San Francisco at the time. And we worked with what would possibly be the tenants of this facility. And I took on the four, first two stories of the building and I worked with the architect Hugh Hines to design these um, words that make up the poem. Every single letter in, that make up the poem is different than the other. And the passage that's up now, just as like waterfalls trembles into rivers, amazing grace wakes us to the beauty of this home. Um, speaks to this community. East Oakland, when in the late 60s, early 70s, when Gary Street was being torn down by Justin Herman, many of the African Americans moved to East Oakland, which borderlines San Leandro. And Carter Gilmore, uh, Park, Carter Gilmore, I think he was a city councilman. Uh, this is a park that was dedicated to him. 
And what they wanted was something that was Afrocentric. So you see the, the gate in the, in the background, those are Indinkra symbols, meaning hope, knowledge, wisdom, friendship. I think there's one that speaks to education. I placed those and cut out steel on the gate. And when the gate is open, children running out, kicking, going to get their ball, uh, could easily run into the streets. So I decided that they needed a barrier. And that's what you see. These indinkra symbols are further articulated in the surface of the pavement. Uh, what you don't see are tables that are made like for checkers or for dominoes. Dominoes are some of the things that are really played in the black community. In fact, they're played all over the world. And the domino I originated in China. And you see elements of that in Italy and the ceramic tiles and other parts of the world. I've traveled to Cuba, I've seen it there. They're sitting around on the street playing dominoes. And then you begin to see the relationships of culture across continents. I worked on this project at Youth Uprising in East Oakland with Johanna Pothick. And youth, at the time, Youth Uprising was a project that worked with young people. They had job training, uh, um, tutoring, uh, recreational, recreational activities for these young people. And we met numerous times with the young people to try to figure out what can we do to keep so that they could buy into this project. And we came up with these words that line the walkway and are printed in the hallways uh, of, of the facility. And then of course the bathroom. We, one of the things that we discussed was what, what, how do you see yourself? What constitutes, how, how do you see yourself and what is your perception of yourself? There's a physicist in, um, the UK, whose name I can't, I think it's, it might be Richard Gregory, but I may be wrong, who came when he was a kid, he noticed that the tiles on the building that he passed seemed to be crooked, but when in fact, it was how his eyes perceived that image. And what happens is, is that when you use a gray grout, it gives that illusion when in fact all the lines are straight. And so on top of that, we print this perception, a wall of perception. We, we printed all of these are glazed onto the surface of these tiles, the words that came up as a result of working with these young people. And we paid all the young people who worked with us, so because their time is valuable. This was a commission by the San Francisco Art Commission for the renovation of SF General. I went around and I photographed natural plants, plants, native plants from that were all over the Bay Area. And then they were put onto these glass panels and named Forever Yours. What more can we do to help those who are really suffering? And this is the, really the first sort of pretty thing that I've done because those who are 
going through a transition in life need to have something that's beautiful. Which leads me to frame. Frame was my, at the time, I finished this in 2015. And Walter Hood has a piece that's in the foreground. It's all the way. And his idea was to give a pixelated image of the bay through the frame. But I see this too as um, African currency, uh, which came in all, all different forms. In the far background, you see the Bay Bridge. And if it were clear, that the bridge would be clear. On the opposite side, you see the peninsula and parts of the East Bay. People who live in this area, um, many of them African-Americans, uh, there was a Portuguese and Italian community. They've been migrating here for years, but they've also been marginalized because of uh, gentrification. And one of the things I wanted to do is to pay tribute to these people who have spent their lives working in this community to then have to leave because of, I don't know if they still call it urban renewal, but it's similar to urban renewal. And, there, and so my idea was to play, pay tribute to them. We had numerous meetings, numerous meetings with the community. And I can understand why, because if you've been in a place, you don't really trust the government that much to, or those in charge to help you. So what could I do to embrace those individuals? So I wanted to place them and the landscape within the context of this frame. I'll move on to my current projects, which is the San Leandro Library, Stevenson Street, and the Southeast Community Center. Um, the, library, uh, the library, as Shelley Will Willis says, is one of the most democratic institutions in the, that we have in this country. It's free and it's open to the public. And for those of us who are curious and want to know more, then what do we do? We ask a question. We can go to the library. We can check out a book for free. We can sit there all day and read. Many of us, I know when I was young, I wanted to ask a question, but I wasn't encouraged to ask a question. So I felt that, and then I would hear someone else ask the same question. And I'm thinking, I could have done that. But for some reason, I wasn't encouraged to, not in, in school and at, when growing up at home, I, would, I could ask questions for days. So I, I, the, it's a, I think it's approximately 10 feet in all, this question mark of, of bronze. And I presented this and then again, they came back to me. What happens with public art is the public or those in charge get fixated on one aspect of your work and they think that's all you have to do. In many cases, it works out. And this one then, this one worked out. So I went, I called up Quincy Troop and I said, Quincy, um, can you come up? I have a piece called Curiosity. Can you come up with a poem that um, addresses this? And the next morning, I had five poems from Quincy 
The shape of curiosity is a curving question mark with a hooked tail stamped on the wall of a library, a metaphor inviting all to enter to discover a rich world of books. Which brings me to Stevenson Street, one of my largest projects to date. And I'm working with Hugh Hines of Proto Inc., Cliff Lowe and Cliff Lowe Associates, their landscape architects, and Nick Dong is my project manager. And uh, about five years ago, I was invited to be a master artist at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. And I met, it's a place where poets and writers and dancers go and work. And if you're a master artist, you lead these series of critiques and workshops. And at one of the performances, Catherine Smith read a series of poems that captured my imagination so much that I wanted to figure out a way to work with her. And when I was invited back to do this street, I contacted Catherine. If any of you have been on third at Stevenson between Mission and Market, you'll see a street that's currently lined with skeleton keys. And these keys, um, line the street along with currently with benches and locks that were turned into seating. So I scaled up skeleton keys and I scaled up padlocks for seating. And at the time when I first did this project, the street was pretty much, the businesses were pretty much vacant. Now with time, the buildings are pretty much full. There are people on the street. It's a lot busier. It's a small little alleyway. And I was con contacted to redo the street. So we came up with these light arbors that are bronze and the Cortin, Cort Cortin, Cortin steel poetry band and bollards that line, there's 352 feet of poetry. So I have these three, these elements that I wanted to concentrate on. Cortin steel and bronze and the, the trees along the landscape. In addition, I'm trying to encourage the developer to paint all the buildings on one side of the, 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 the street, variations of red. So you have these rich elements that play off of one another. And this is the back of the Jewish Museum and the poetry band that extends around the seating area and the new landscaping that will go in. Here's it is, here it is from a, another view. And then there is a walkway that joins Stevenson Street to Yerba Buena Plaza. And this is out of perforated Cortin steel. So this area was meant sort of a quiet space within a bit, very busy city. My proposal for the, this is my, was my second time, maybe even third time around for submitting a proposal to the San Francisco Art Commission for the Southeast Community Center, which is on the corner of Evans and Third in San Francisco. And I have been collecting African currency for, for many years, for many years. And I decided 
to scale up this currency to 18, originally it was 20 feet, to 18, 16, and 14 feet. Because many communities embellish themselves with jewelry. I mean, that's how they show their wealth. And it's not just the African-American community, but it's most communities. Um, and I placed this, them upright because it reminded me of the, of the bottom portion of a ship. But at the same time, the vertical support systems in the, behind this were like strings to a harp. So these bronze sculpture will, is the public art for this project. This is um, a piece that I did, I think this is at Yerba Buena Center in 1992 or three, um, I can't remember. But I had come back from Brazil and, and was influenced by the, the wax parts of bodies that hang in churches and also the African retentions within that culture. In the newspaper at that time, it says one in four African-American males had a, a better chance of going to jail than completing, going to college. And I'm thinking we have one of the largest incarcerations of people in the world. And what can I do to speak to that? So I came up with this, there are 400 wax feet on the floor on a bed of white gravel. This is the first iteration of this piece. And this is the Harlem men's gay choir performing at the opening. When Cap Street moved from Cap Street to, is it, was it Second Street, right near the bridge, the entry to the bridge, I, um, I was commissioned to do a piece for their new facility. And I decided to once again look at history as a way of showing what once was and also praying, paying tribute to not just the music, but the people who helped to build San Francisco. So I ran railroad tracks through the facility. The image on the left, you see a luggage cart and the railroad tracks that go into these two large fixture, fixture uh, 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 images that are are both the same, it's just that they're reversed uh, in the, their position so that the child is standing next to one another. It's, it's as if this, the railroad tracks are meeting this, this underserved group of people. Um, on the right side, you have chickens in a chicken coop. There are two coops, one for chickens and one for people. You could go inside, sit, and listen to John Coltrane playing Too Young to Go Study. And Mel, the late Mel Sharp uh, performed. He started on a block away and performed playing uh, sort of New Orleans style music and a line dance all the way to inside of the 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 facility and on each one of the tracks I had names of people who helped uh, build the railroad. 
the Chinese community uh, participated in that, in building the railroad in this country. So there are names of Chinese individuals that I made up. This is in site 94, the last train. It was the first insight. It was the relation showing the relationship between the United States and Mexico. In the South, African Americans uh, pick cotton. In California, Mexicans and other Latin Americans pick cotton. In fact, when my family moved here, they had never seen cotton until they got to California. And I put it on a bed of coal because it, it gives all these mixed messages. But the thing about coal is that it turns to diamonds. And when I thought about that, I thought about South Africa. Uh, Vita Brefis, which was sponsored by the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, invited me to do a piece. And I went to several locations trying to find a facility that would work. Once again, I took the railroad tracks and placed them within the Old South Meeting Hall. And what I... What was interesting about this place, I had never been in there before, is that it was a place that where abolitionists went. Phyllis Wheatley was a member of this church. So as you walk down these wall, or the visitor walks this, down these railroad tracks, you see yourself in the mirror so you become a part of that experience. And my current exhibition that's up now, originally it was at the, the Atlanta Ken Award exhibition, uh, 10 little children standing in line, one got shot and then there are nine. And I put this up because it's so relevant for today. A week doesn't go by when you don't hear of some kind of murder on young black folks. When you think about Breonna Taylor in her bed, sleep, and someone comes in and murders you and nothing happens. What's the difference between this and these young people running, holding one of their classmates who got shot because they wanted to learn English as opposed to African. So, Toni Morrison, what a, a, a great loss, but she left us with a rich rich history of words that speak to the human condition. This is a new project that I began, well, relatively new, about three years ago uh, with Kala Institute. And I brought together a group of young African-American males and one young African-American uh, teenager. They were all between the ages of 14 and 25. And I wanted to present us have a safe space so that they could talk about their concerns and how they felt about what was going on. And these and I put them in the shadow because my first concept was to have banners made and have the banners span between Oakland, Emeryville, and Berkeley, and with their quotes, but funding of all, you know, of course, stop that. But this is the result of those 
those that work. Having a conversation with people who don't expect you to acknowledge them, like the homeless person on the street, gives me joy. This is a 24 year old. I've noticed that the more freedom I have, the more responsibility I have. Before I do what I want to do, I need what I need to do, I'm cool with that. XYZ Summit. And the, prior to that, I had been working on this whole series where I took uh, original 1940s uh, black newspaper and juxtaposed and collaged and uh, images onto the top of these. And when you look at the headlines, same thing, same thing's happening today as it was then. What I like about the one on the left is that they have these women who behind the, 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 the musician in the front and then this World War I worker. And then on the left, we have the two young guys behind Mitzi. Because of my color, I have to present myself as though I am not a threat to anyone. I don't want others to feel afraid of me. I know that I've been on, got on a, a elevator and there was a young guy on it and I could see people who were not black sort of move into the side. Which brings me to my, my piece that I, I, I did on Casanova. And there was a, a two volume set of Casanova books in, uh, in Venice in an old antique bookstore. And I went into the bookstore just looking around and I found this, this, this two volume set Two years later, I was still thinking about it. And I um, sold some work and was able to purchase the two books. And this talks about how races intermingle. I mean, since the beginning of time, people have mixed together sometimes for love and sometimes for not. This work addresses that. The figures were originally white, but I decided to make them black. The one on the right, the man that's reflected in the mirror is Tucson Overture. And the guy with the cape has no idea that Tucson Overture is looking in the mirror because he's so busy checking out the other woman or her derriere. And this is new work that I've done that was shown last um, January or February at Art in the Armory on Park in New York. It was the last show that I had with um, when Ed Gilbert was alive. It's still strange to say that when he was alive. The house that will not pass for any color than its own uh, will be installed next week in Battery Park City uh, along the Hudson River near the Jewish Museum. So I'm excited about that. And that's what I'm working on now along with all the public art pieces that you originally saw. Thank you. And before I close, I'm gonna read a poem that will go on, on Stevenson Street that talks about Stevenson Street and on Stevenson Street on a January night, 
where docks once reached. I hollow the small of my arch back. I am San Francisco on a rainy dead end of the financial district. Behind the scaffolding of the Mexican Museum, footsteps brightening the storm. Beneath the Aronson buildings, dripping cornices of olive, olive branches, cast iron pilasters, dark martyr. Beneath streets graded by Irish men, the towering sand dunes carted to swamp land. I am the soaked bones of the West African shipbuilder and German saloon keepers in denim manufactured by the Rochester Clothing Company. Indigo dyed cotton now filling the valley with the worn stitching of Mexican seamstresses. I am the needlework of migration street lit relic of prayer more than rumor. Beneath the sidewalk top behind Jesse's garage and the plaza, I am the Filipino ghost waving goodbye to third graders holding hands, walking out of the Jewish museum, shouting Mandarin above the rain. I am engineers in suits exiting cubicles who kiss and turn into lovers soaked by downpour. I am the workers hurrying home beneath street lamps, each one a brown score, a penny, the copper face of North America across the water, the key that turns in the dark. Catherine Smith wrote this for Stevenson Street. Thank you. Mildred, thank you for this uh, deeply moving presentation. Um, it's incredible to sort of realize the, the breadth of the work that you've done, especially in the public realm over all those decades. And one of the words that just kept popping into my head is, you know, the, is care. I mean, with how much care uh, goes into the conception of your work, care for so many different communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear, especially after, he, after listening to you express your disappointment over the status of blue, your different experiences with the care of communities for your work um, as you have placed it in those communities and whether you could speak to the different types of experience you might have had in that context. Well, the community, I don't think, is the problem. I don't think the community, I think what happens is the, in the community is the result of the injustice of this country. It's just, it's, it's, it's part of the result of so much uh, that if you look, I mean, if you think about how unjust things have been, I mean, this country, People came to this country, they, I guess, they, I think they were criminals because or, or they came, some of them were criminals. Some of them wanted to come here because they wanted a better way of life, but a better way of life did not include people who look like me and variations of my color. They just didn't. And I think that's the problem. And until we address this systemic racism in this country, it's going to continue. So I don't think it's the people of the community. I think it's a result of how those communities are viewed by those in charge. Well, the and last six months have been exactly. exemplary for that, exactly. Right. The, the, the last six months have amplified it, but it's always been here. Yeah. The lights are on and the cockroaches are out. So, yes, there you go. There you go. There you go. And when I walked, uh, one day I was walking on Gary Street and talking with the maintenance guy who was trying to take care of this. He said, it's not the people here who, do, who did this. 
Yeah, it's people from I the don't... outside coming they in. Come in. Yeah. yeah. How have the last six months been for you? Obviously, you've been fighting for social justice in your work for so long. Do you feel a sense of hope at this point or of progress, no. potential progress? Hope, yet a little pessimistic because I've gone through similar kinds of things, but never to this extent. Never have I seen so many people from various walks of life come out in support of what's been happening. So yes, I do with hesitation. I, I think see, it behooves us all to be hesitant, right. especially I, in advance of the elections. <laughs> yes, yes. When I see Black Lives Matter in these wealthy sections, yes, I'm really happy to see that. But can I get a house? Do I have a house there? No. People I know, maybe one or two, yeah. When you think about less than 1% of the population, having most of the wealth. I mean, look at that picture alone. Yeah. I mean, you've lived in the Bay Area your entire life. You're from Berkeley. You're committed to staying here and continuing the work to do here in the region mm -hmm. now more than ever before? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> at this point in my life, I really would like to have a little bit of solitude and less craziness going on in my head. But I don't know if that's even possible because there's so much work to be done. And surprisingly, I've got a considerable amount of work done in this period. I just, uh, a big major survey of my work just closed at Parrish Heinemann Gallery in Los Angeles. That was real successful. I'm about to mount um, a, one of my public pieces in New York, my first exhibition in New York, probably solo in 20 years. That's um, fantastic. Where yeah, is that going to be? And at, in Battery Park City. Wonderful. Yeah. And I have three, one major uh, public art piece that clo uh, just uh, com was completed that I worked with Johanna Pothick, Pete Richards, and Joyce Yu. It was a collaboration. It's the, all the railings and windscreens that line, from, go from downtown Oakland to San Leandro. So we just completed that. And I have three public art projects that are in the mix, along with preparing for um, a new show coming up next year. So I'm busy. Well, and you did show Toni Morrison's quote about needing to stay busy, especially yeah. in times of yeah. crisis. So yeah. Yeah. Um, you brought up collaboration and obviously that's something that is pervasive through your work, your um, inspiration with po coming from poetry and music. And it makes really for the generous spirit of the work. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of collaboration? Has that been part of your practice from the beginning? Well, I've always read a lot of poetry and, I, and reading in general was a part of my upbringing. And I would just see the images in my head. And when I realized that I could actually make a living out of art, then it was a natural marriage between the two, where poets and writers use words, I use images and sometimes their words. And also the collaboration between architects and engineers, it's enough being an artist. I mean, that's enough work for me. And being able to collaborate with our uh, architects and engineers to make sure something doesn't fall on someone. And how do you take this object that is 
six inches and make it 20 feet. All of that, I depend on other people. And that also speaks about artists now having to be social workers. And um, it's not, yes, I believe in social justice, but we have trained social workers and psychologists. Why should I be charged with taking their job? I they're there. Agree. Yeah, they, they're here. But yeah. artists have to always remake themselves. I mean, both that's interesting, but it's also sometimes a difficult challenge and a real burden. But Whether I think like it or not. Unique, unique um, you know, opportunity to metabolize these issues and bring them into view in ways that social workers maybe don't have. Exactly. I mean, looking at you, you know, framed by your own work. Yeah. In the background that, of course, opens our view, our consciousness to the history of the East Bay and its communities and populations. I mean, that's such a powerful statement. And also, I can't help but think about Lorraine O'Grady's art is oh, yes. in relationship to this particular piece and the relationship of your work to, you know, art history and, and, and artists who have worked along the same lines, like bringing black history, black communities into view in ways that haven't been necessarily been done before. Yeah, it's, it's, it's black history, but it's the history of the America. Yes. As you said. Yeah. It's the, the so-called American. Yeah. Dream. I had a quote, if I could find it, that Tony, and I read it a lot, that Tony Morrison said, uh, uh, wrote on the Colbert Report. And she says again, there is no such thing as race. Racism is a construct, a social construct, and it has its benefits. Money can be made off of it. People who don't like themselves can feel better because of it. It can, be, can describe certain kinds of behavior that are wrong or misleading. So racism has a social function, but race can only be defined as a human being. I, I, just, I was just filling out an application for another art thing, and they wanted to know how did I want to see myself. And as a result of reading Toni Morrison and James Baldwin and all the other artists that, uh, writers that I read a lot, I put human. I think that's a beautiful way to end this conversation, Mildred, because that's exactly how we should think of one another. So let's tear it all down. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Mildred and Claudia, for sharing your time, your insights, and your conversation with us today. Thank you so much to Lindsay and the other members of our behind the scenes special events team. I am certainly not running this Zoom on my own. And thank you, our members, for joining us today and for supporting us every day. The De Young Open is now open. And if you have not yet made your reservations to visit, please visit our website at deyoung.famsf, that's F-A-M-S-F dot org. O -R -G, or email us membership at famsf.org to reserve your spot. You must have a time ticket to enter the DeYoung and I highly recommend an advance reservation as we are booking up several days in advance. If you enjoyed today's event, and I hope you did, please consider making a tax deductible donation at donate.famsf.org. Your gifts help us serve more than 1.4 million people, including families, students, um, seniors, youth, people, art lovers of all ages every year. A gift in any amount will make a tremendous impact and we truly appreciate your support so much. As members, you already do so much. So thank you in advance for going above and beyond. Again, that's donate.famsf.org to make a contribution. You should be seeing a poll on screen now, so please do take a moment to give us your feedback. And once more, thank you all so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to be here with members. And if you have any questions about what's on view or how to use your membership benefits, don't hesitate to reach out. We're here for you at membership at famsf.org. Take care and thank you.